All right, good afternoon everybody. How is everybody doing? Say hi to me in the chat. Let's go ahead and get started. We are going to be looking at this, um, these review problems for chapter 14, all on refraction and lenses and all that kind of stuff that we've been talking about. Um, so let's see, how's it going? How's it going? All right, Hannah, your brother timed out with me. But it's all right because I had him in checkmate in a few moves anyway. All right. So let's get started here. Um, once again, we do have a test on uh, Monday. So make sure you guys are ready for that. And if you guys don't have any specific questions about anything, let's go ahead and just jump right into the review. All right. So which of the following is able to change the speed of a light, right? You think of it as a constant but it's not a constant because light will change its speed when it goes through different materials. So the answer is C, changing the medium it is traveling through, right? If you change the frequency, the wavelength changes. If you change the wavelength, the frequency changes in either one of these, the speed of light is gonna stay the same, okay? Number two, um, which of the following is not changed due to refraction, all right? So refraction does change the speed of light, which means that one of these other two needs to also change. And that is gonna be the wavelength. The wavelength is going to get smaller or larger depending on the material that it's going through. And so the frequency needs to stay the same and that needs to stay the same because the waves are occurring at the same frequency. They're occurring a certain number of waves per unit time still. And as long as the objects are not moving, the frequency is going to stay the same. Now the frequency can change, um, you know, like we've talked about for the Doppler effect when you have some kind of moving object and that can change the frequency. But when you're just going through a material, that's going to change the speed of light and the wavelength. All right. So next up, number three, what is total internal reflection and how is it achieved? I don't think I feel like writing all this stuff out, but essentially total internal reflection is simply when light is stuck in a material for a, an extended period of time. So it can't escape because rather than go out, it just reflects in and that occurs when this angle is large enough, right? And so if you have any time for any kind of two different materials, let's say this is just some kind of plastic here, right? And this is air. When you have any kind of two different materials, the light is always able to travel through the material if it hits it straight on. But oftentimes, let's say for a fiber optics, what if we shoot the light out at an angle, okay? So as long as this angle right here is large enough, if this angle is large enough, then the uh, light is going to stay within the material, right? And as long as your difference of index of refraction is large enough, then you're going to be able to stay within the material, right? And we have an equation that can basically do all that. And so this, this would be your critical angle, the angle that is necessary. So greater than that, it would internally reflect so that critical angle is equal to the inverse sine of the index of refraction of the, um, the well, the, refra the, the material that is going to go into over the index of refraction um, of the incident material. So this should be like an R. So it's not actually refracting, but so that's going to be your equation that's going to solve for this critical angle and larger than that is going to totally internally reflect. Now, typically speaking, that light is going to get out sometime, right? And let me just specify, this is going to be your NR, this is going to be your NI here, okay? Now, typically speaking, the light's going to come out sometime, so it says total internal reflection. Now the light is probably eventually going to come out and that's because for example if you have fiber optics right you might have in total internal reflection for a while and then you'll come to let's say the end of the material right so it's going to bounce 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 and once you come to the end then it's going to hit it at an angle where it can actually go through 
All right, and that's gonna happen because we have a different face here. Same thing with gemstones. Gemstones have multiple different cuts to them, so you have different angles, so that although it's gonna reflect a lot of times, eventually it's gonna to come to some face or some part of a face and it's gonna be able to exit. All right, so how does refraction of light in droplets of water produce a rainbow? So essentially you have these droplets of water and your book talks about this extensively so you guys can you can look at the picture in your book and your book's going to do a lot better job in terms of showing you how this is going to work but basically the droplets of water are all going to act as little prisms and so you have little droplets of water in a cloud or you know in the air or whatever and so when the light comes in, so if you have, yeah, so if you have, um, let's say sunlight coming in, right, this light is going to be bent if it's not coming directly. So if it's coming directly in, it's not going to be um, a real issue. But um, when the light comes in at an angle, so let's say your light's coming in at an angle here, okay, that light is going to bend. And we've said that higher um, frequencies or lower wavelengths are going to bend more. And so because you have a greater bending, and this is going to be repeated over and over again in all of these droplets, because you have a greater bending of first purple, and then I shouldn't have used red here, but anyway, first purple, and then, and then blue, right? And then you have green, and you've got the whole rainbow right here right and then green and then yellow i don't have any yellow here and then finally um your red your roy g biv okay so you have a greater bending of your lower wavelength higher frequency light and that's going to happen um, when it's inside that water droplet okay so more bending of so more bending of higher frequency light. And that, in effect, separates out your different colors and so you can get a rainbow. And it happens repeatedly in all of your water droplets and that's how you get a rainbow. All right, so next up, we're gonna calculate the angle of refraction of light as it travels from air to glass at an incident angle and this is, this is going to be Snell's law, right? So you have your, um, uh, your N I sine theta I equals N R sine theta R. And in this case, you have, what is it? It's going from air to glass. So let's just say air up here and glass down here and it says an incident angle of 40 degrees it's important that we understand well, what in the world does that mean well in this case um, well it's not 45 but it's close to 45 if it were 45 it wouldn't make a difference but in this case it's not 45 so we're gonna try our best so it's something like that and you have an incident angle it's this angle right here this is your 40 degree angle and if you're going from air to something else it's going to bend toward the normal. So it's gonna bend like this, such that this angle here, this angle of refraction is smaller than the incident angle. This is your incident angle. And your air, Ni is one, and your glass, and R is, um, let me see, I don't have this on me. What is it? I think it's like 1.4 something, but I don't remember. No, no, 1.52. Oh, no, it says right here. Um, this particular glass. So I guess that's different from crown glass, which is 1.52. So it says the, the index of refraction of glass is 1.46. Didn't even see that, 1.46. There we go. And so now we can solve this. Thank you, Mani, I, I see your, thank you. And it is right there, right in front of me. I didn't even see it, look at that. All right, so we are going to go ahead and plug in some numbers here. You have Ni is 1, so we can just remove that. So it's going to be 1 
times your sine theta i incident angle is 40 degrees equals an r, so it's 1.46 times sine theta r, um, and that's what we're solving for, the angle of refraction. And so your sine theta r is simply going to be sine 40 over 1.46. I just want to remind everybody one last time to make sure your calculator is, oh, make and make sure you have a calculator. I don't know where my calculator went. This is terrible. This is terrible. All right, um, make sure your calculator is in degree mode. Can't believe this. All right, let's see if my, let's see if my website here can do signs. Calculator. All right. I hate using computer calculators. It doesn't even have an inverse sign on this thing. That's dumb. All right, shoot. I need, I need to get myself a calculator. All right, guys, chill out for a minute. I will be right back. I'm gonna look for my calculator. I think I know where it is. Sorry about this. All right. Tree, you got a tree? I love trees. I need, where's that, that tree emoji is awesome. Um, sorry about that guys. I totally misplaced my calculator. All right, so here we go. Let's do this. So we have sine 40 divided by 1.46 and you take the inverse sine of that and you got your answer 26 degrees. All right, 26.1, yeah, well, well, we'll just leave it at 26 degrees. So make sure, make sure one last time that your calculator is in degree mode. So if you go to mode and you go over here, Sometimes when your calculator resets, it will go back to radians. All right, so make sure it's in degree mode. Otherwise, your answers are gonna be all wrong. All right, so next question. We have an object and it's placed on the principal axis of a thin converging lens. So thin converging lens, make sure you realize this converging, that means your F is going to be positive, right? and it has a focal length. All right, so here it tells us the focal length is 14. So F is 14 centimeters. If the distance from the object to the lens is 21 centimeters, well, that of course is P, 21 centimeters. What is the distance from the image to the lens? So we wanna know what's Q, what is the magnification, right, what is you know, draw the ray diagram, it is the image, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate this. We have the lens equation, which is the same as the mirror equation, right? One over P plus one over Q equals one over F. So solving for one over Q, that's gonna get us one over 21 plus one over Q equals one over 14. And we can go ahead and do that in our calculator, 1 over 14 minus 1 over 21 gets us this, and we take the inverse of it, right, oops, we take the inverse of it because that's 1 over Q, that's the value of 1 over Q, and so we want to take the inverse of it, and that's 42. Don't forget to take the inverse of it at the end. 
I had some people doing that last test and that were just writing down Q equals 0 0.0238 or something crazy like that. That's wrong. You have to take the inverse of it, right? So 1 over Q equals 0 0.0238 and that's inverse centimeters, right? Because this is 1 over 21 centimeters, this is 1 over 14 centimeters. So Q is equal to 42, not just 42, but 42 centimeters. All right, um, next up we have M is negative Q over P. And so we're expecting a negative number because those are both positive. So it's gonna be negative 42 centimeters over, we had P was 21. Well, 42 divided by 21 is just two. So this is gonna be negative two, which means that we can now say everything that we need to know about this. It doesn't actually give us the object height, so we can't calculate the image height, so we, and it doesn't, we don't need to. All we need to do is say, well, this object, first of all, we look at Q, Q is positive. And so it means it's on the opposite side of the lens, which is where the light is going to, which means it's real. Anytime Q is positive, it's gonna be real. M is negative, which means that that thing is upside down, so it's inverted. And also, it's big, right? It's twice as big, so we're expecting that. So let's go ahead and do the drawing. All right, some of you guys did really, really well on the mirror drawings last test, and some of you guys didn't. And you, some of you guys just kind of winged it and thought, okay, it's okay, I'm just gonna draw something, and it doesn't really matter. Um, but then you got the drawing wrong. Don't get the drawing wrong. The drawing's the fun part. Get the drawing right. And get the math right too. <laughs> All right, so we have a converging lens. Let's just draw it like this. Converging lenses look like this. We have the center right here and we have two different focal points. Depending on where we're starting from, let's go ahead what did it say? 21 is the value. We'll, we'll go ahead and just use 21 then. Trying to just make this measurement as good as possible. So here's a focal point there at 21. And then that means 42 over here. Okay, that's our focal points. And we have the object. Oh, I'm sorry. The object is 21. The focal points are 14. My bad. Let's make this then, all right, 14. It's gonna be small, but we can do it. 14. 14 and 28. Okay, those are focal points and the object is one of these and one of the other points is just bogus. Okay, so let's make the tree over here. I already know that this tree is going to get big, so I might as well just draw it like not too terribly big. I probably already drew it too big. Something like that. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to take the light into the lens and then it's going to bend as it goes out or bend as it goes through. Okay. And so parallel in from the top. Parallel in, once it comes in here, it's going to go through the focal point, and I'm expecting it to go a little distance here. All right, and then the other one is going to be going through the center and then straight without bending at all. So I'm going to go just like this. And notice, all right, so how the refracted beams intersect over here which makes a lot of sense to us, right? This is the real side of the lens, right? The other side is the real side of the lens. It's gonna be upside down, so where they intersect is the top of the new tree. And it's inverted. It looks like it's upside down, right? Um, and it looks like it's bigger. I don't know if that looks quite twice as big, but it's you know more or less twice as big. And 42, so we said what this was this was what, this was 14, and then, yeah, that's, I don't know, that's more than, more than 28, I don't know if it's quite 42, so maybe, 
it should be out a little bit further if I drew that a little bit better, but that's pretty much how it should look, okay? Tree is bigger, it's real, it's inverted, just like that. All right, next one. A diverging lens, so expect on your test to have a converging lens and a diverging lens. Expect to have both of them. Um, I don't know, you know, what what exactly the situation is going to be. It might be something where you have an object here. It might be right on the focal point. It might be over here. That's going to affect what, how the object is going to look over here or the, how the image is going to look over here or if the image is going to be over here. But be prepared for that. All right, next up, we have a diverging lens and a focal length of 11.2. Diverging lens right away. That's a real indication that we need to pay attention that this is a situation where we have a, a negative focal length. So F is going to be negative 11.2 centimeters. And we have an insect placed at 9.53 centimeters in front. So that's going to be your P. Where's the image? So we're solving for Q and we're solving for M, all that stuff. Same thing, okay? Same equation. 1 over um, 9.53 centimeters plus 1 over Q equals 1 over negative 11.2 centimeters. All right, so we solve for Q in our calculators. What are we typing? 1 over negative 11.2, and we're going to subtract, which is essentially going to make that bigger, 1 over 9.53, but we're going to take the inverse of it, which means it's going to be smaller than what we would expect, or it's smaller than either of those two, which it is, at least the absolute value is, um, negative 5.15, so Q equals negative 5.15. And we stop and think, well, and don't forget your centimeters. We stop and think and say, okay, does that make sense? Should it be negative? Yes, because this is a diverging lens. Diverging lenses, diverging mirrors always give you negative values for Q. All right. So that's going to be an M value, which is M is negative Q over P, so that's going to be 5.15 centimeters over P, which is the 9.53 centimeters. So it's going to be a positive value for M. Nine point. And we're getting out a positive value, positive 0.54. There's no units for M. Magnification should not have units because it's going to be centimeters over centimeters. Centimeters over centimeters is going to cancel out, and we're left with just a magnification factor, which means that this object is going to be 0.54 times smaller. So it's about half the size, but not quite half. So a little bit more than half the size of the original. All right, um, and we can let's make a couple notes here. Is the image real or virtual? Well, it's a negative value for Q. When Q is negative, that's going to be a virtual. When the M is positive, this is going to be an upright image. And we can see that this is smaller. So let's go ahead and draw this. And your diverging lenses, keep in mind that they're fat on the ends, and they're going to come in and be fat on the ends like that, thin in the middle and fat on the ends. So that's your diverging lens. That's what it looks like. Um, a lot of, if you're um, nearsighted, your glasses are going to be somewhat like this. This might be a little bit exaggerated, but that's kind of the idea for your lenses that correct for myopia. And what do we have? We have a focal length of negative 11.2. So I'm going to go ahead and draw them as, let's say, 22 and a half, I think, would make sense. Something a little bit more drawable. About like that 22 and a half. That's the focal point.
Okay. Um, and so our P is going to be, so that's about, a, um, it's going to be about 19. So they're pretty close together. But remember, your focal points are actually on the opposite side. All right. Let's go ahead and make this fairly large because we know it's going to get smaller. Okay. And keep in mind that when it goes through here, the focal point, if I'm going from left to right, the focal point is not that, but it's actually this. So we have two different focal points, but that's the one that is going to be going through. And I just realized I'm going to be writing all over my numbers, but that's not a big deal. You might want to give yourself a little bit more space. Or you know what you can do? You can even do the drawing first. But I like to do the math first. It just seems to me to be reassuring when I do the math first. Okay. You can do the drawing first if you want. So my beam of light is going to come in here. Once it gets to the middle, because it's a diverging lens, it does not converge into here. In fact, it spreads out. And the way it spreads out is through the focal point, but the focal point is coming from over here. All right. So the light is actually going to go out this way, but it's, we know that it's never ever going to intersect. The beams of the light are not going to intersect on the real side, on the opposite side, they're going to intersect over here. So we, what we really care about is the trajectory or where the beam of light came from, and it came from over here. Okay, So that's the way the light is being bent out. But what we care about is the extended beam because we know that they're going to intersect on this side. All right, the other way is the light that's going to be coming in and going through the center, which is just like this. Okay, so the light comes down, goes through the center, and then boom. And this right here is how the beam's coming in, but it also is where the refracted beam has come from. Okay, and so this, where these two things cross, is exactly where this image should be. And so we're going to go ahead and draw the image right here. And this looks really, really good in terms of placement um, about five which is great because remember this is a, this is right here nine and a half and this is 11 and so that makes sense is five and it's a little bit more than half the size of that so that makes a lot of sense for this to be our image it's upright and that makes sense because this is positive so all of this looks really really good for a drawing for this one so guys be prepared for two problems on your um, your lens drawings and do your calculations but keep in mind all the different things I've talked about in terms of make sure you write your units down people last test missed points I don't know how many probably at least five of you guys didn't write down centimeters for your units and you got points taken off right um, or or something else here or somebody forgot to take the inverse right so you have you're calculating one over Q, make sure you actually take the inverse of it to calculate Q. So be aware of that too. Okay? Go through these problems and make sure you guys are getting them right on your own. Last one is not a tricky one. We have a ray of light going across a glass to liquid interface. And the index of refraction is 1.62 for the glass and 1.32 for the liquid. So now it's not going from glass to air, but glass to liquid. If the light meets the interface at a particular angle, predict whether the light will refract or whether it will undergo total internal reflection. I don't know just by looking at it, okay? And so let's go ahead and do the calculation, right? So that's our angle. Um, that's our angle of incidence. And the, let's just use the calculation to calculate the, the critical angle, so we don't even need to use that, and we can just compare it to the critical angle. That's probably the easiest way to do this problem. And so that is simply just to say, okay, my critical angle is going to be the inverse sine of your refracted index of refraction over the incident index of refraction. And so getting this right, um, is pretty important, okay? So which one goes on top? 
Well, in general, it's going to be the smaller one that's going to go on top for this kind of problem. Okay, but you don't necessarily know right from the beginning whether it's this kind of problem or not. Okay, so which one's going to go on top? Well, we say the refracted index of refraction. So the material that it's going into, so this is always material coming from. That's where the light is originating. The incident, the NI, um, is the material that it's coming from. Okay? So the material is going from, so it's going across a glass to liquid. So it's going from glass, and here this glass is 1.62, so that's some pretty high index of refraction glass. So 1.62 and 1.32 for the liquid, whatever that liquid is. I have no idea. That's pretty close to water's number, so maybe it's, who knows, something similar to water. And that's a one-step calculation, 1.32 divided by 1.62 is 54.7, no, six, sorry, 54.6, 50, 54.6, we're just going to round that up to 6 degrees, okay? And so what does this tell us? That tells us that angles that are 54.6 or greater will have total internal reflection. Angles that are less than that will not. Now there will be, when you get close to that angle, there will be some internal reflection, but you're going to have a large amount of refraction and it's going to leave the material. So in this case, if it's meeting at an angle of 52.7, well, how do we analyze that? What do we do? This number is less than that. It's close, but it's less. And so in this case, it will not internally reflect, reflect because this number, this angle is less than that. Right? The greater the angle, the, um, the more likelihood of total internal reflection. So it will not internally reflect. And I want you guys to make a note of that because we haven't really mentioned this in the homework very much at all. We've just been calculating critical angles and we haven't said, well, how do you analyze something like this? I think you might have a problem like this in the test. And so make sure you're able to not only calculate the critical angle, but say, will it actually internally reflect or not? And in this case, it will not because the angle of um, incidence is less than the critical angle. Okay? So that's that. We are all done. Um, we have a whopping four people with us, and it looks like one of them isn't even in our class. So, um, so what do you guys, do you guys have any questions on that? I, pr I bet that the, the three of you guys in my class that are here probably already got all these things right anyway. But um, any questions? If the critical angle is bigger than the angle of incidence, doesn't it internally reflect? If the critical angle... So the critical angle is the angle at which it will internally reflect. So it has to be, it has to be the, it has to be bigger than the critical angle. So the smaller, think about it this way, the smaller that critical angle, the more easily it's going to internally reflect. We did this calculation last time in the, um, and we compared, remember we compared, um, what was it, diamond with cubic zirconia. Let me see if I can find that calculation again real quick here. Oh man, the physics stuff. Here we go. So last time, remember, this was our calculations. We looked at the critical angle for cubic zirconia and the critical angle for diamond. We said diamond has this ridiculously small critical angle. And so what does this mean? That means that light that is greater at an, coming at an angle at greater than 24.4 degrees will internally reflect. Okay? Anything less than this will not. And so we can look at it this way. Okay? So if you have an angle of, so you have your material that the light is in to air, or in the other case, we had some kind of liquid like water, right? Remember, that we're comparing the, the angles for all of these that we're looking at is, is this angle right here, light coming in, 
and we're looking at this angle right here. This is going to be your incident angle. If your incident angle, and so it's the angle between the normal and the incident light. If that angle equals zero, no matter what the material is, you will have all that light leaving the material or more or less no internal reflection. Okay? So if this, then no or essentially no internal reflection. Okay? And the greater this angle is, the more likely it's going to bounce back. All right? The greater this angle is. Now, so that's basically the internal reflection is is pretty much dependent on two things. It's dependent on the material, or the two different materials, and it's dependent on this angle. So if we go back to this problem, okay, and we, we recognize that that this critical angle is fairly large. Why is it large? Because you have a fairly small difference between these two index of refractions. So it's fairly easy for light to leave or go between these two different materials. Okay? And so this angle is smaller. The incident angle is smaller than that, and so it can leave. If the incident angle is greater than that, it will be totally internally reflected. Okay? So really, really important that you guys get that aspect to it too and don't just calculate the critical angle. You need to understand what the critical angle means. So if the critical angle is bigger than the angle of incidence, then it will not internally reflect. Yes. All right, I probably took long, way too long to answer that question. Um, do you guys have any more questions? Adam, yeah, so my long story short is the answer is yes. Okay, no, thanks. Okay, cool. Um, anything else? So before, so we're gonna have a test on Monday, so this is it. Last chance. It looks like a beautiful day out there. I think it's finally spring. And then probably next week it's gonna be 80 degrees and it's gonna be summer. So we go from using heat to using air conditioning. Really, really pathetic. Oh, yeah, you missed me. I, I understand. Oh, all right. Good, good Chinese. Good job. Good job. Yep. Next week, it's going to rain. Oh, yeah. It, it does tend to rain a lot in the spring here, which is fine. It's good. It means I don't need to water stuff. It, it's nice that it rains at nighttime. I like that. And then in the daytime, it's nice and sunny, hopefully. All right. So I think that's it. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. And... See you guys later.